Okay, so the Gospel of Mark, chapter seven, uh, beginning in chapter seven, verse one. This is lesson number five, and uh, it's entitled Truth, Tradition, and Other Miracles. So in the first six chapters of the uh, book of Mark, the Gospel of Mark, uh, Mark has clearly established his case for the deity of Christ because that, you know, that's his main goal. We've talked about that. Basically reviewing here, he's shown that by his teaching, Jesus claimed to be the Messiah. It wasn't just other people were coming to that conclusion. It was like by his teaching, he was speaking with authority. Um, he, um, he has uh, described the miracles done by Jesus that could only be performed by someone who had supernatural power. No mere mortal could do those things. And even in describing the reaction of the people, uh, there's the suggestion that they were impressed and they were believing his claims. Some of them were. So Mark also keeps us aware of the difficulties uh, that Jesus was encountering from various groups who witnessed these things, but refused to accept, refused to believe uh, the very things that were happening before them. So Mark is you know, also keeping track of how the non-believers you know, were uh, reacting. Some rejected Jesus and turned away. Others attacked Him, and Mark uh, talks about this. There's also another story, another plot line you know, going on, and the sub-story is of Jesus and His apostles. How Jesus was teaching and developing them as apostles and how He was shaping their faith, how He was preparing them to realize the very uh, significance of his uh, mission and his ministry. So you've got him doing things publicly with people and then that second kind of line of, uh, uh, that second storyline of him uh, developing his apostles. So now we get to chapter seven and eight. We get back into this cycle of miracles and teaching as he continues his ministry among the people. So in chapter seven, not going to read this section, it's too long, but I think you're familiar with the story. Um, one thing that Jesus was teaching uh, His apostles was the very great difference between human religious traditions and the authoritative word of God. These were not necessarily the same thing. The Pharisees had made you know, a life's work out of creating and maintaining an intricate set of religious rules and traditions that were based on the scriptures but were not authorized by the scriptures. For example, the uh, word of God said uh, not to work on the Sabbath, uh, not to do your regular job on the Sabbath. The Sabbath was there to focus your mind, your energy on God and also a time for rest. That was what the command was. But the Pharisees invented torturous rules to define, well, what exactly work was. And for them, for example, uh, lighting a fire, that was work carrying more than one stick of wood, that was work. Walking further than so many paces, that became work. So they explained and they monitored and they punished those who broke these rules. Not necessarily the command itself, but the rules that they had made up to sort of protect the command. So in chapter seven, Mark describes a conflict between Jesus and the apostles and the Pharisees over these rules. So we pick up the story uh, chapter seven, beginning in um, uh, verse one. It says, uh, the Pharisees and some of the scribes gathered around him when they had come from Jerusalem and had seen that some of his disciples were eating their bread with impure hands, that is, unwashed. Um, just verse one and two for now. So a religious, notice, they come from Jerusalem. So they send a delegation to him to question him about his teachings and the question uh, was the morality of the apostles because they ate their food with unwashed or impure hands. Now the implication was that by extension, Jesus the teacher was also impure. So if, if your disciples are doing impure things, it must mean that your teacher is somehow impure, somehow teaching you these things. So their reason for this accusation was that they believed and taught that if a Jew came in contact with a Gentile or something touched by a Gentile, they would be defiled or impure because when they touched their own food and ate it, they would transfer the Gentiles' impurity unto themselves, like bacteria, okay? So being impure, of course, meant 
that you were not allowed to go in and worship. You couldn't go to the temple, you couldn't practice that. You couldn't be in mixed company with others. You had to go through a, a, a purification ceremony. And guess, guess who was in charge of that? Okay, so it was a, a big long uh, uh, process. So let's keep reading. It says, for the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they carefully wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. Notice he doesn't say uh, observing the law of God. It's the tradition of the elders. And uh, when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they cleanse themselves. And there are many other things which they have received in order to observe, such as the washing of cups and pitchers and uh, copper pots. So these rules for washing that Mark makes a parenthetical statement about uh, were invented by the elders or the Jewish teachers over the years. Of course, the Old Testament had rules about washings for the priests, yes, but uh, there were no rules for the people. Uh, the priests had to wash when they went into the temple, when they had to perform their duties, they had to wash, they had to put on the tunic, they had to put on their, you know, their priestly robes. And yes, there were rules for them, but the, 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 pe the common people didn't have those rules. These things were invented by uh, the scribe. So in verse five it says, uh, the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat their bread with impure hands. So they challenged Jesus by accusing Him of setting aside these rules and traditions established over the years. So listen how Jesus responds. And He said to them, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching His doctrines the precepts of men. Neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of man. So Jesus doesn't even answer their question. He makes no apologies. He accuses them of being hypocrites. Interesting, the word he uses here, hypocrite, this word is only used in the Gospels in this way when referring to these guys. Uh, the word means especially religious hypocrisy. It refers to an actor under a mask. Okay? So the hypocrite, you know, he tries to act before men the way he ought to be before God, and yet he is not. So the worst form of hypocrisy is when you begin to believe the act yourself. Then, you know, my mother used to say that. He's such a liar that he's believing his own lies. So this is pretty much what Jesus is saying. So Jesus quotes Isaiah 29, 13 to describe the two types of hypocrisy. One, those who honor God only with their lips but not with their actions. And two, teachings that are invented by men but are presented as being from God. And that's what they were doing. All right, let's keep reading. Verse nine, it says, he was also saying to them, you are experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and he who speaks evil of father and mother is to be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father or his mother, whatever I have that would help you is korban, that is to say, given to God. You no longer permit him to do anything for his father or his mother, thus invalidating the word of God by your tradition which you have handed down, and you do many things such as that. So after denouncing them as hypocrites for saying and not doing, and teaching human doctrines as coming from God, Jesus gets specific. He gives them an actual example of this type of hypocrisy as practiced by the Pharisees. He even adds one more condemnation, saying that the only way they succeed in their imposing of human traditions is by first removing God's laws. So in other words, the only way you can impose these things is by first of all removing God's laws. So there's two accusations. Not only are you a hypocrite, but you're also removing God's laws in order to be a hypocrite. So the example he gives has to do with the responsibility of honoring one's parents and then caring for them probably in old age, the fifth commandment, honor your father and mother. Is, honor your father and mother is not just, you know, don't say bad things about your mother and father, it's also honoring them in the way you care for them when they are uh, in need. So their responsibility by God's command was to honor and care for their parents. So what they did is they created a rule that if you, um, if you pledged your money to God, that was Korban, then you wouldn't have that money for anything else, like to be able to help your parents. Now, it doesn't mean they actually gave the money to the Lord. 
just that their money was devoted to the Lord and thus couldn't be used to help their parents. In other words, it was in trust. So in other words, I've set aside this money here and uh, this money is in trust you know, for the Lord. And you know, the, the help that you need from me, well, I, you know, I can't give it because the only extra money I got is in trust. But that money being in trust didn't mean that it actually went to the Lord. It meant it was frozen for a time. And then when it was convenient, they would unfreeze it and take it back. That, that was the point, that was the hypocrisy. Okay. So in this way, they kept their money, they didn't help their parents, but they felt good because in doing so, they convinced themselves that they were honoring God. Look at me, I've, I've put money in trust for the Lord. It's different if they said, well, I had money and there was a need and I gave it away and I'm sorry I don't have any for you. No, no, that wasn't the case here. Okay. So it was a systematic way of preventing and, and kind of you know, uh, buffering themselves for taking care of the needs, uh, not only of their parents, but needs uh, in their family. So Corban by itself was not a bad thing. You know, making a pledge to leave money in one's will to donate to the temple, you know, that was a good thing. But not when it outweighed the more important need of caring for one's parents. Okay. So Jesus says that they had a lot of things backwards like this. He doesn't name them, he just uses that one example. So in verses 14 to 23, uh, Jesus gives another example of this inconsistency by responding to the earlier accusation concerning the washing and the defilement. Notice he hasn't talked about that yet. That was the original accusation. So now he talks about that. In, um, and he explains that food does not have the power to make a person pure or impure. You know, morality has to do with a person's heart, not with his stomach. So food is, you know, he, you know, a familiar passage. He tells them, you know, the food that goes in the mouth, it, it goes out. It passes it through your body. So food is consumed and voided. It has no moral effect in and of itself. Washing before eating did not increase or decrease one's standing with God from a moral perspective. Morality, impurity, was not like bacteria that could be transmitted by touch or contact. It was things that, you know, stem from a person's heart. So in saying this, Jesus deems all foods clean. In other words, there's not a moral value in eating or not eating. And for the Jews at this time, this would mean pork. Now he wasn't changing the, the laws of Moses. If you were a Jew, you were under those laws. Okay. But he was, he was talking to the heart of the matter about food in itself. You know, the commandments for the Jews not to eat certain foods wasn't about um, uh, that food is bad for you, this food is good. It was to make a distinction between the Jews and the rest of the people. Uh, the Sabbath, the command for the Sabbath day. Uh, what was especially important about that from, from, from looking at it from the outside? Well, the Jews were the only people who, had, who set aside a particular day for the worship of God. Today we take that for granted, right? But back then, they were the only nation that actually set aside an entire day. Even their slaves you know, did not work on that day. That was very peculiar because no other nation had a thing like that. Slaves, seven days a week, you know, they worked from sunup to sundown. People, you know, they didn't consider one day higher than the other. So all these things were given to the Jews to make them a distinct people, religiously and socially and culturally, and so on and so forth. So Jesus also clarifies that the thing that causes impurity are the things produced by what the heart uh, you know, thinks of, and what the lips speak, and what the hands carry out. What you think, what you say, what you do, these are the things that make you impure in God's way. Of course, now, uh, you know, starting Pentecost, the gospel is preached, the Christian era begins. Well, you know, Christians, you know, we're, we're not under food laws. You know, we can eat pork if we want to or not want to. We can be vegetarians if we choose, or we can be meat eaters if we choose. You know, there's no there's no law that those things don't make us more or less pleasing to God. If you choose not to eat certain foods because you feel it makes you more you know, pleasing in God's sight, fine. You, know. you can't impose that on somebody else. I'll tell you one thing, usually false religions, the very first, two things they try to control. What you eat 
and marriage, who you can marry or not marry, or you know, you've, got, you've got to be a, you know, single and so on and so forth. If they can control, control what a person eats and if they can control their sex life, and I don't mean from a moral perspective, but from who they can marry or not marry or when they can marry or not marry, if they control those two things, they control that person. You take a look at the various religions and you'll see they all have very specific food laws and so on and so forth, but not Christianity. Why? Because of what Jesus taught right here. Okay, so once again, Jesus shows that substituting man's word for God's word or God's rules is hypocritical and it's dangerous. Hypocritical because we believe our traditions are more important and more effective than God's laws. And yeah, we have that in the church sometimes, right? People get into a big you know, tizzy because we change the hour of Bible school or uh, we cancel a Sunday night service or it's, it's, it's winter time and uh, on Wednesday night we're gonna, we cancel Wednesday night service because we're all going to go worship or have a, a sing-along at a, a particular church in another uh, community or something. And most people go along with it, but there's always people, oh boy, they get, they get really bent out of shape over that. Why? because they think that our tradition, and Wednesday night church, it's a good tradition, I'm not saying it's a bad, it's a good tradition, it's healthy, and I encourage it. We need fellowship, we need teaching, we need encouragement, but it's still a tradition. It's not a law of God. You know, I mean, uh, there, are a lot of, there are many churches of Christ that don't even have a Wednesday night service, did you know that? Not, not here in the Bible Belt, but in a lot of mission countries, they don't, they don't have Wednesday night church. They don't have Sunday night church. They have a Sunday service to take communion and to share and so on and so forth. Why? Well, because that's something that is commanded in the Bible. But Wednesday night church, you know, some people, you know, they don't do Wednesday, they do Friday night. Okay. So we need to always be careful not to raise up our traditions and put them at the same level as God's word. They don't. Our traditions usually are there to facilitate our doing God's will. But when we make them as important as God's will, we run into the same problem that the, uh, that the Jews do. And it's dangerous because we lose the power to change and affect our lives when we exchange the simple word for tradition. And we lose sight of what's important. We, we focus on the rules and keeping the rules instead of focusing on God's word and His real laws. And we lose salvation because Jesus tells us that only those who do the word of God will enter the kingdom. Okay. So as far as our, you know, our, our study of Mark is concerned, when we get to chapter seven here in this episode, we see that now Jesus has made a mortal enemy of the Pharisees because He has not only answered them, but He has denounced and exposed them as hypocrites publicly. So now you know, the worm is going to turn now. Now it gets very, very dangerous. In the meantime, we have, a, we have another episode that takes place the Syrophoenician woman, chapter seven, verse 24. We see that Jesus has now earned the wrath of the religious leaders by exposing them through His teachings. Now He is going to earn their undying opposition by performing a miracle on behalf of the persons that they had originally complained about. Remember what the original complaint was? The original complaint is, you know, wash your hands before you eat. You may have touched something that a Gentile has touched and therefore made yourself impure, right? So now, he, now Mark says the next thing that Jesus does is what? He performs a miracle for a Gentile. The very persons that, <laughs> that the Pharisees were you know, all upset about. So, um, they argued you know, that you could defile yourself simply by touching something that a Gentile touched. So as I say, Jesus is going to do a miracle that will heal a Gentile, and this in their eyes would be a major breach of their laws. It wasn't a, a breach of God's laws, believe it or not, because the Jews were supposed to be a light and a blessing to the Gentiles. They were supposed to kind of open their eyes to the true God, and that's exactly what Jesus was doing. But the Pharisees had so many rules to avoid falling into idolatry uh, of the Gentiles that they completely cut off any opportunity to witness to them or to be any influence to them by the way that they acted. Imagine, you think you could influence someone to be converted to your religion if when they approached you and their shadow crossed your shadow, you crossed the street so their shadow would not cross your shadow? You think you have a big chance in sharing the gospel with them or sharing your faith with those people? I don't think so. 
So let's read the story, it's interesting. Uh, chapter seven, verse 24. So after this episode, Jesus got up and went away from there to the region of Tyre. And when he had entered a house, he wanted no one to know of it, yet he could not escape notice. But after hearing of him, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately came and fell at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of the Syrophoenician race, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he was saying to her, let the children be satisfied first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered and said to him, yes, Lord, but even the dogs under the table feed on the uh, children's crumbs. So verse 24, Jesus you know, leaves Capernaum and he goes to the extreme border of the country to avoid the crowds and to avoid the enemies. And so the woman that comes to him, uh, a Gentile, a pagan, but she believed in his power. Note how her approach was different than that of the Jewish leaders. They came to him with an accusation. She comes to him with a request in humility. So Jesus responds to her request by describing his primary mission. And his primary mission is to feed the children, God's chosen people, the Israelites, and to preach the good news to the Jews first, according to the word. Now we need to understand, you know, when we talk about dogs, it sounds awfully insulting what he says. You know, I want to feed the dogs like you're calling her a dog. You know? Dogs in the culture of those days were wild and they survived as scavengers and few people owned them and they were not, you know, they were not welcomed. In those days, you know, like today, you know, everybody and their brother has a dog, but in those days, no, that was not something you did. I, really? Take your good food and feed it to a dog? Have the dog sleep with you in bed? No, I don't think so. That, that's not, that was not their culture, okay. Some families, however, kept Smaller dogs, I guess, as pets, but again, this was exceptional and they were fed scraps from the table. Now, Gentiles were considered like dogs by the Jews. And if they were friendly, they were friendly no more than a person would be to a pet. So Jesus uses the word for pets, not dogs, in this passage. And he's saying, let the children eat first, as is proper, because it wouldn't be right to feed the pets with their food. That's what he said. So this woman, under, you know, it's like, it's the same thing. You've made a, a nice uh, meatloaf and veggies and so on and so forth, you know, and yeah, you have your beloved pet there, you know, shoo shoo, your little pet, you know what I'm saying? Would you really take a plate and, and make a portion for shoo shoo, you know, and with bread and butter and, and the meatloaf and the veggies and take that and, and give that to shoo shoo before you gave it to your kid? Well, no. No, first I'll feed the family, and then what's left I'll give to Shushu. That's how it works. And basically he's using that imagery. Okay. So um, she understands this. She knows, her, she, knows, she knows that there's animosity between the two people. She knows how the Jews see her. You know, it took a lot of courage for her, a woman, to go see a man on top of that. So she understands that righteousness must, must be fulfilled. You know, first things first, but when they're done, she says, couldn't the don't the pets get the leftover? She's using his imagery and saying, hey, okay, according to your story, the pets still do get some food, don't they? So she understands her position in the community and she asks only for a small portion. So in verse 29 and 30 it says, and he said to her, because of this answer, go, the demon has gone out of your daughter. And going back to her home, she found the child lying on the bed the demon, the demon having left. So Jesus performs a great miracle, this time at a distance, exercising His will only in casting out the demon. Now another example of Jesus is dealing with this common problem of that era. You know, interesting to note that Jesus deals with demons and related problems 80 times in the gospel. It was a tremendous issue uh, in those times. Uh, another interesting thing that you see about the demons that are spoken of quite often here in the New Testament, uh, demons never manifest themselves as monsters. Never in the Bible. Okay? Not like the movies. The movies, the demon comes out and it's some funky looking thing, you know, whatever, you know, the, whatever the Hollywood artists can figure out. You know. But in the Bible, the demons are real. They cause trouble, they're evil, they're of Satan, but they never materialize as some sort of monster-looking thing. 
So they never manifest as monsters, they never manifest as persons either, outside of the people that they possess. Their presence is only known because of the suffering that they cause. Because the Bible writers say this suffering was caused by a demon. And, and the writers make a distinction between the suffering that was caused by a demon possession and the suffering that was caused by an illness. The woman, for example, who had the issue of blood, they didn't say she was possessed by some demon that was causing, no, no. She had a disease, a bodily disease that Jesus healed. So the writers in every instance always make a clear distinction between the suffering caused by demon possession and suffering caused by illness. Okay? Or suffering caused you know, because someone is born lame or handicapped or whatever. Always a clear distinction between those types of, those types of things. All right, so uh, Jesus now returns to the area where the demoniac had lived. Remember we talked about that? Demoniac when it wanted to come with him. And he said, no, 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 go back to Decapolis, go tell your people the things that have done. So now Jesus goes back to this area and we read what happens there. It says, again, he went out from the region of Tyre and came through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee, within the region of Decapolis, that's the Deca, the 10 cities. They brought to him one who was deaf and spoke with difficulty, and they implored him to lay his hand on him. So a crowd gathers and wants to see a miracle, and they tell Jesus to lay his hands on the man to heal him. So D Jesus does miracles to prove who he is, not to put on a show. So let's keep going, verse 33. Jesus took him aside from the crowd by himself and put his fingers into his ears, and after spitting, he touched his tongue with the saliva. And looking up to heaven with a deep sigh, he said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, and the impediment of his tongue was removed, and he began speaking plainly. And he gave them orders not to tell anyone, but the more he ordered them, the more widely they continued to proclaim them. What an interesting healing this is. I mean, in one instance, he says to the person, yeah, go home, the demon is gone. He didn't even go there. Here, there's like, he's interacting with the individual. So you have to understand, the deaf and dumb, can't hear, can't speak. So the man is confused. He's facing this strange rabbi. So Jesus takes him aside, first of all. Now the crowd is there messing with him and you know, the shouting and so on and so forth. This is, he can't hear, he can't talk. So Jesus takes him aside, one on one. And he needs to communicate to the man what, is about, what he's about to do. Well, how do you communicate to a, a deaf and dumb man you're about to heal him? How do you tell him that? What do you do? Well, you use some kind of sign language, right? I mean, today we don't say deaf and dumb. I guess we say uh, hearing a hearing impaired. That's it, hearing impaired. But he was completely hearing impaired. He couldn't hear, couldn't speak, right? So what does he do? He uses sign language. The fingers on the ears to, single, to signal that the problem is in your ears, right? You can't hear. Uh, uh, he spits and touches the tongue. Why? To signify what you can't speak. Uh, a sigh and a look up to uh, heaven to show where the solution is going to come from. It's a way to communicate that the man's own prayers, the sighing, are now uh, going to be answered. Okay? So he looks at him and he says, be opened. And the fact that the man hears and responds is a sign that the miracle has taken place. Because the man right, speaks. So verse 37 says, they were utterly astonished, saying, he has done all things well. He makes even the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. So once again, Mark comments that the reaction of the people demonstrates that they were convinced that they, these were legitimate miracles. All right, feeding of the 4,000. We need to move a little bit here. Um, uh, feeding of the 4,000 is chapter eight, uh, verse uh, one to uh, 21. Well, here in verse one to 10. Um, this is the second time that Jesus performs this miracle. If you read some commentaries sometimes, some of the scholars, they say, oh, well, he's, you know, this is, it only happened one time. You know, it only happened one time. But no, Mark records it twice. So you know that it's the second time that he does this miracle because Mark would not have repeated 
the description of the same miracle twice. None of the gospel writers ever do that. Now, some of them you know, describe, you know, Mark will describe a miracle that was in Matthew, or Luke will describe a miracle that was in Mark, but Luke never describes the same miracle twice in two different places in his gospel as Mark does. So Mark describes the first instance of the, you know, the, 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 the food being multiplied, the, the bread and the fish being multiplied in chapter six, and then he describes another instance, same type of miracle in uh, chapter, um, chapter eight. So it's a similar situation, a similar, similar outcome, but the people and the location are different in both instances. Now this miracle actually sets the stage for teaching that Jesus will give His disciples after they leave this place. He warns them about the Pharisees and their teachings. Remember, this whole section started with the Pharisees showing up, right, and challenging Him. Everything after that is all hooked back to the Pharisees. Everything that He's done in one way or another you know, points back to them. So, this miracle here, what does he teach concerning it? Look at the great power that I have, or Jesus can take care of your needs? No, the, the, the lesson he's going to draw from this for them is be careful of the leaven of the Pharisees. That's, that's the lesson, okay? So he warns them about the Pharisees and their teachings and treachery. Now that he has uh, incurred you know, the Pharisees' wrath by exposing and condemning them publicly. And he does this using a figure of speech comparing their evil to the leaven you know, that's hidden in, a, in dough. Of course, the apostles, they misunderstand, thinking he's chastising them for forgetting to bring along some of the leftover bread. And then he chastises them for real, not for forgetting the bread, which was true, they did forget the bread, but for failing to understand what was going on failing to recognize who he was after seeing so many miracles and, 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 and teaching. So now we have another miracle here, this time uh, curing a blind person. Verse 22, it says, and they came to Bethsaida and they brought a blind man to Jesus and implored him to touch him. Some, you, do you see something similar here? Before they brought him a hearing impaired and a deaf and implored him to touch him. Now they bring him a blind person, same, same idea. Uh, taking the blind man by the hand, he brought him out of the village. Oh, it does the same thing. Gets away from the tumult, brings the guy you know, away from the tumult. He brings him out of the village, and after spitting on his eyes and laying his hands on him, he says to him, do you see anything? Uh, next verse, and he looked up and said, I see men, for I see them like trees walking around. Then again he laid his hands on his eyes and he looked intently and was restored and began to see everything clearly. And he sent him to his home saying, do not even enter the village. In other words, not your village, don't go back to where we were. You know, don't stir up more, you know, more chaos here. So in this passage, Jesus performs another great miracle, healing a blind man. The miracle, like the deaf and dumb man, was done in stages so the man could realize what was happening to him gradually. And Jesus needs time and he needs to be free of movement to finish his ministry, so he tells the man, don't go back to the village, don't stir up more stuff there. It's hard enough as it is you know, moving around the country without the, you know, the crowds following him. So then we get to chapter eight, um, and it seems that the gradual opening of the man's ears and the man's mouth and then the gradual opening of the blind man's eyes, these miracles also serve as a, a kind of a symbol or a metaphor for the gradual opening of the eyes of the apostles and the gradual opening of their ears to understand and to see exactly what is going on. The people he healed, they could talk to each other, that he could now hear what people are saying to them, the blind guy could actually see what was going on, but for the apostles who could already see and hear, their problem was they weren't seeing the truth and they weren't hearing and understanding what Jesus was trying to explain to them. So sl slowly but surely Mark demonstrates that you know, Jesus is opening them up uh, to the truth. So now uh, Jesus asks them directly, who do they think He is? And Peter acknowledges the conclusion that all the miracles and teachings point to, that He's the Messiah. And with this confession, Jesus 
His first goal with His apostles has finally been reached. You see the, the balance there? The healing of the blind and the deaf and the opening of the minds and the hearts of the apostles. The blind and the deaf could see the natural world, what is going on and, and, and hear and so on and so forth. But the apostles now, their eyes were open and their hearts were open, not just to the natural world, but to the supernatural world because they finally say, well, you're the Messiah. You're the Son of God. Okay. And Peter declares it. So with this confession, Jesus' first goal has been reached. They believed the evidence before them and they confessed the conclusion. So Jesus warns them not to share this just yet. To preach this now would cause riots and there's still another important goal of His ministry to be met, one that He now begins to explain. So uh, even in our lives, okay, this is how the Lord teaches us, through the Spirit, through His Word, through the church. It's always in stages, always in, you know, we learn something that opens our eyes to some, a new vista of understanding or work or service or whatever, and that eventually will lead us to yet another level and another level and another level. Okay. Uh, this is why it's important to just keep going. You know, sometimes we fail, sometimes we see ourselves as sinful and weak, you know, and the thing we want to do is stop or quit you know, because oh, I'll never make it, I'm no good, I'm not good enough, blah, blah, blah. You know? And it's like the Lord is saying to him, stop, don't quit, keep going, because I got something else I want to show you. I want to show you something different. Don't worry about the sins, they've been forgiven on the cross. Don't worry, I know you're not perfect, that's why you know, you're under my grace, I know that. Just keep going. Okay. Well, this is what He does with them. They recognize, well, you're the Messiah. Okay, well, He kind of says to them, okay, now I got something else I need for you to understand. <laughs> and that's the cross. That's going to be a, mm, that's a big bite. Okay. So he's going to talk to them about the cost of discipleship. All right. So he goes to verse 31 and says, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. So wow, you know, it doesn't waste any time. Once they grasp, oh, you're the Messiah, whoa, great news. Now he starts teaching them the next level, that the Messiah has to be killed because if you read your Old Testament properly, you'll understand, Isaiah especially, the suffering servant, you'll understand that this Messiah is going to be killed. He's going to be sacrificed for the sins of men. So he begins to describe the purpose of his ministry, the reason that the Messiah has come, and the final end. All right, verse 32, it says, And he was stating the matter plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning around and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get thee behind me, Satan, for you're not setting your mind on God's interest, but man's. So Peter's reaction is not one of acceptance and reverence, but worldly and fearful. He dismisses Jesus' words as a bad plan. He even overlooks the news of the resurrection. His idea is that the Messiah's coming is going to bring a blessing to the Jews. They're going to rule. He's, as an apostle, he's going to be on the A team. You know, uh, you know, it's going to be the old days, the days of the golden period, you know, and he's going to be you know, part of the leadership of that. Peter didn't want a dead Jesus, suffering, rejection. That was not his idea of the glorious Messiah, and especially his own role in bringing the Messiah to the Jews. Jesus rebukes his selfish ambition as being motivated by Satan, the flesh, not God, not the Word. So we finish up and it says, and he summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake in the gospel will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, in, his, in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father and the holy angels. So Jesus establishes the criteria for those who want to be disciples. Of course, that includes the apostle. You want, I'm the Messiah? Okay, well this is what the Messiah is going to have to do. He's going to suffer and die, but he'll raise again. And do you want to be the disciples of that Messiah? This is what you've got to do. He reads in the riot act. They believe he's the Messiah. So as the Messiah, this is what he demands of his followers and why he demands it. He demands that each of them choose 
who they will follow. And if they follow Him, He will save them. And if they don't, well, there's nobody else that's going to save them. Tough choice. So until this time, it's been a wonderful ride for these guys. It really has. I mean, great teaching. He opens their eyes and their hearts. Tremendous miracles to all them. And remember, they're with the guy who's doing the miracles. <laughs> you know, it's like the, the governor. You know, the governor gets on the plane. I remember once Governor Keating, you know, he was on the same plane as I was and he was rushing. And, and I got on with the governor, you know, the governor, his bodyguard, and, and then I got on to a plane. I mean, he was going to Dallas, you know, whatever. And people were looking at him, oh, hi, governor, you know, hi, governor. And then they, they're looking at me, I'm a nobody, but I was walking three feet behind the governor. You know? I was somebody for 10 seconds till I went to economy. <laughs> and he stayed in first class, you know what I'm saying? So these, these men, they're with the guy doing the miracles. The crowds, the 10,000 crowds that are following him everywhere, they're with that guy. So it's been a good ride. He's put down the Pharisees who had restricted them for so long. He feeds them, he heals them, he encourages them. He takes the brunt of criticism on himself and protects them. So it's been a good ride. But now Jesus says, it's time for you to make a choice, to take a stand. You're with me or you're not with me and your soul depends on this decision. And so, this is the choice of every believer and every disciple and every follower and every student of Christ. Somewhere along the line, you have to make a choice. And after this critical point, Jesus will continue the cycle of miracles and teaching and will open the eyes of His apostles even more as He leads them to the climax of His ministry and that, of course, will be His cross. And of course, that's not the end for them. They just keep on going after that. But we'll continue this next time. So there's lesson number five. All right, great.